Here we are. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I see we're recording. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I think people will be joining as we start, but uh, really excited to kick off this uh, BTRAX Q4 event on user research best practices, um, understanding Japan. So we have uh, some, we have a presentation that's going to be happening and a panel discussion. We'll do some Q&A and then a breakout room uh, scenario. Um, really excited to kind of like get to know some of y'all and hear from our esteemed speakers. And so we're going to kick it off with a little bit of warm up. Um, and before I start the warm up, I'm going to share a I guess a, I, I speak Japanese, I grew up there, but I do forget a lot of my Japanese since I've been living here for a while. And I was talking to Susie today, who is going to be presenting next. And she, we were going to talk about music. And she said, you know, you should play my favorite uh, J-pop. And I'm like, who's that? And she's like, Voundy. And if you know anything about Japanese, I don't know why anybody would name themselves Voundy, because it starts with a V. And so this band is called, or person is called Voundy, V-A-U-N-D-Y. And I asked, all right, so what's this song about? And it's, the song is called Maba, Mabataki, Mabataki. And I honestly, I forgot what Mabataki was. And so she looks at me and she says, you know, Mabataki. And so in English, if you do this, what do you think that means? Anybody? What does this mean? It's talking, right? No, in Japanese, it means blinking. So if anybody in Japan ever goes like this to you, I guess that means blinking or it's a Gen Z thing. And then that's a whole nother story. Um, but without further ado, let's kick it off with uh, a warm up. If you have your phones, this is going to be interactive. So you'll need your phones. We're going to do something um, where I'm going to ask you questions and you're going to share. You all can kind of point your cameras at the, the screen. But here we go. Are you all ready? I'm seeing some head nodding. All right. Oh, he's a brand new, I don't know if he's a brand new artist. Uh, I'll, here we go. All right. So there's going to be three questions that we're going to kick off the day with. Um, and so you can either join at slido.com or you can point your QR code, your phone. I'll give you a second. Yeah. And some of the Japanese people may not know, actually. <laughs> I'll give you a sec. And so, yeah, it should be, hopefully the answer should be popping up. It's an active poll, it says. Vietnam, all right, we got Vietnam. So Japan imports over 80% of this country's annual coffee production. What country is that? And it does, you know, it'll be between 65 to 85%. Um, if you don't know, don't feel bad. It looks like uh, most people don't. <laughs> if, that's a, if that's a clue for you. I'll give you another couple seconds. I see some people typing. Three people. All right. I'm going to take a sip of coffee while... Uh... I did not plan on drinking coffee while doing this one. Mm. And, and I know that there's quite a few people here who are in Japan or and or Japanese. And so you're, everybody's about to learn something. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you the answer. Two people are typing and oh, keep going. I think, yep. Well, the correct answer is Jamaica. Yeah, and it's a super interesting story, actually. Um, I was going to share links and stuff, but you all have computers, you all have phones. If you really want to learn about it, Google Japan Coffee Jamaica. And basically, they somehow managed to get 60 to 85% of all annual Jamaican Blue Mountain Coffee. So Blue Mountain Coffee is like an expensive, high-end coffee. Um, and it's apparently a national obsession in Japan, so much so that starting, I think, since 2018, every January 9th, uh, they celebrate Jamaican Blue Mountain Coffee Day. So I think, you know, if anything, if you get nothing else from this event, I think you started out with some knowledge sharing right there. All right, so next one, let's see if the next one's easier or harder. I don't know. Um, let me make sure I can go to the next slide. Okay, so when eating out, I had, I had a lot of trouble trying to figure out how to phrase this question. When eating out, what is the average number of people at a table? Mm 
All right. This one, oh, oh, we're mixing it up a little bit. Okay. I, I think I've given you all plenty of time. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, apparently Japan is hailed as, hailed as the solo dining capital of the world. Um, you know, for different reasons, whether we're talking about the shrinking population, more single person households, uh, but requesting a table is quite the norm. And I think for anybody who's maybe eaten at an Ichidan, you know, a ramen place in Japan, um, that's, then you're like, oh yeah, they're only meant for one person. They're like little cubbies. So, so yeah, um, I was actually wondering if anybody was gonna like change their answer to one uh, after I uh, spoke, but it looks like it stayed consistent. All right, last one. And then we're gonna kick off the event. We're gonna start talking about what you all really are here for, and that's for UX research. But, uh, whoa, here we go. The first geisha in Japan, Japan were men. True or false? Mm -hmm. All right, Back to full. Oh, switching it up. Some people. Oh, wow. All right, 90 ton. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So the answer is true. Um, the first uh, geishas appeared in somewhat like something like the 13th century, uh, originally men. Um, they both advised and entertained their lord, uh, but by the 16th century, they became more of like storytellers and creating conversation and inciting humor. Um, and then women started becoming geishas, and by the 1750s, uh, none of you were around then, but women became geishas. Uh, women geishas outnumbered the men by that point. So I hope you found that interesting uh, i have not been following the chat so you might be saying john that was a waste of my time i apologize uh but without further ado i think the next thing we're going to be doing is having uh suzy ito who is a design intern at b tracks present on some findings but she also decided to have fun with this so she is an intern at b tracks she's studying uh ux research and when I was meeting with her when she started, one of the things that I wanted her to do is go through the whole process of doing research to ideate and validate uh, an idea. And obviously it has to relate to Japan. Um, and so she decided to do it around the travel industry, which is timely, right? Because Japan has opened up. And so you may be getting some insights into the travel industry uh, along with uh, what I think is a pretty cool idea. And so without further ado, let me switch. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Susie, and I'm going to present the case study that I did for this event regarding Japan's travel industry and the opportunities available. Okay. So before we jump into the case study, I want to introduce myself a little bit. So hello, hello. My name is Suzuka Ito. I go by Susie. At Btrax, I am a UI UX design intern, mainly doing the design related tasks, but occasionally um, assisting our research team with the user interviews and such. Education wise, I am a, a fourth year student at San Francisco State University, majoring in visual communication design. I moved to the States in my junior year in high school but I'm originally from this city called Okazaki in Aichi, Japan. Okay, so moving on to the case study. So now that we are going into post-COVID, I wanted to do a project that was related to travel because I know a lot of people, including myself, go back to travel, enjoy a lot of traveling. I'm personally going to Japan this winter, really excited and planning to go on a trip with my friends from high school. So I thought it'd be nice to design a travel app that would help me with planning the trip. So the goals of this project was to do some research on Japan's travel industry and also to create a travel mobile app. Oh my God. Okay, so here's how my UX research process looked like. First off, I did the exploratory research. I did, uh, I did some online research to what, figure out what the problem is in the current Japan's travel industry. And after finding the uh, problems, I came up with the solutions and also um, came up with the concept as well. After having the concept, I moved ahead to 
the proof of concept just to make sure there are people out there who want this idea or this concept to be a real thing because we don't want to make something that people don't need or don't use so make sure to just have the user needs out there i did that with the screening and also the user interviews after that i finalized everything did some test uh usability testing in general, usability testing is done with the potential users, but, but for the sake of time, I had to skip it. And instead, I asked our professional, amazing design team for the feedback, and I incorporate that into the final design. So starting off with the exploratory research, again, the goal of this phase was really to define a problem. So this is the chart that shows how people's desire to travel has changed before and after COVID. So 34% of people say that they want to go on a trip travel more than before COVID. 33% say felt the opposite way. They don't want to go to travel anymore. And th uh, the rest, 33% said it hasn't changed at all. And looking at the total number of domestic tourists in a quarter, so within three months in Japan. As you can see here, in 2019, there were over 150 millions of people traveling, but at the beginning of 2020, COVID hit, the number went all the way down to under 50 millions. But owning to this travel service or travel campaign called Go to Travel, the number went up again uh, from the second quarter of 2021. And you might be wondering what go to travel is. And I think this campaign plays such an important role in the current Japanese travel industry. So let me briefly explain what it is. So go to travel is a travel campaign run by the Japanese government um, to encourage people to travel during the COVID by providing people about 35% discount on their trip expense. And as you saw from the last chart, it went pretty well. It went successful and has been contributing to not only limited to just the travel industry, but also to um, the food and entertainment industry as well. Speaking of services, these are the services and platforms that people use before, during and after trip for planning, booking, transportation or sharing. Unfortunately, we do not have time to go through each of them, but knowing these services and having understanding of them really allowed me to see this um, Japan's travel industry as a whole and also to know what services are and are not there yet. Okay, so now I wanted to know the traveling situation specifically for my generation, which I guess you can call Gen Z or young adults. Um, so I found this article talking about this trend that Japanese young adults turning away from many different things, from owning a car, owning a house, watching TV, gambling, drinking, buying brands, and it includes traveling as well. And what article says was that this is mainly because for two reasons. One, they are having different perspectives in value compared to the past. And two, they simply can't afford it. They are not getting paid enough to enjoy all of these. And I looked into more into just traveling and found out the three main reasons why young adults are not traveling as much anymore. And the first reason was, again, the money, limited budget. And two, they got no time. They can't take days off to go on a vacation. And three, they're just too lazy to plan out the trip. And for this one, my assumption is that two, first two reasons, so limited budget and no time, mingling together and making them lazy to plan out for the trip because they have to decide the destination. They have to research and then come up with the, the places that they can go within their budget in within their limited time. So that's a hustle process to go through. So now I, have, now I have three problems. I brainstormed and came up with the solution for each of them. 
For the first one, limited budget, we can maybe offer affordable travel plans utilizing campaigns such as go to travel. And for the no time problem, we can make weekend getaway suggestions quick and easy. And lastly, for those who are lazy, we can provide a complete travel plan so that the user feel all ready to go. So with these solutions put together, the concept that I came up with is to create a mobile app that creates affordable weekend travel plans for the users. So now I have the proof of the concept. I moved on to the next step, which was the proof of concept. The methodology that I used were screening and interviews. So for screening, I did uh, just, it was really just to look for the potential users that I can have the interviews with. So I asked for the general information like name, age, occupation, gender, family structure and such. And I also asked for a couple questions regarding travel, like their trip frequency or their interest level in travel. And after that, um, I did some interviews with the users. It was more open-ended questions. So what do you value the most in a trip? How, how was the last trip? What do you care about the most when planning a trip and such? So from the user interviews, these are the two key findings. The first one, the trip destination depend on their mood. So if they're tired, they want to go to onsen or hot spring or, you know, some relaxing places. And if they're happy, then they want to go to amusement park, maybe Disneyland or some entertaining places. And the, num uh, the second finding was that um, user also care about the reward point system in addition to using campaigns. So like Rakuten points and stuff. With these key findings, I finalized it, designed the app, asked for some feedback, and this is the final product. Uh, so it turned out to be the app that creates a complete personalized trip plan based on their mood and budget. So we learned from the user research that people, the two things that they care about the most when they're planning a trip is the budget and the mood. So the app will ask you some questions regarding the budget and mood. And based off of that data, the app will create a weekend um, trip plan suggestion. And we also learned that uh, people really do care about if they can use the coupons or campaigns, ju really just to minimize their uh, trip expense. So I made sure that the users can see if the trip plan is eligible for the campaigns or coupons that they want to use. And that is it for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And if you want to learn more about VTrax, scan it, and then you're going to visit the VTrax website. Well, it's kind of fun. It's, um, I think that was a really good experience for uh, Suzuki-san. And it also gives you an idea of, you know, I think one of the things she was surprised to was also is she is the, the target market. And there were surprising facts that she learned. Um, and so, there's still people joining. Jen, what question did you have? How did you find your the people for your user interviews? For me, what's easier because I have I'm the target audience and I got a lot of uh, connections from Japan because I was born and raised in Japan. So I asked all my friends, also asked on my Instagram for some you know insights for it, and also I found the user interviews. Yeah. And it's Instagram, the social media of choice for your... That's my main uh, platform that I use in general. So Instagram also did try out the LinkedIn, but it didn't really work out because LinkedIn is not really a popular platform there. So, yeah. Yeah. So, for those of you older, doesn't it feel good to, to be on the same platform as the Gen Zers? Uh, that's my platform of choice too. <laughs> All right. Well, if, uh, wait, okay, Fabian asks, how did you find the data about the services people use before, during, after? That was mainly, 
a bunch of different articles because different articles have different you know information so um, I didn't search up just one article but instead like try out different many different articles and then uh, put all the information together into one uh, table all right were there any findings that surprised you any findings that surprised you um, I would say the part where it talks about the trend among Gen Z, mm. like losing interest for everything, it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. They're being more like a realistic, realistic mm -hmm. in a way. It does make sense, but it was also pretty surprising for me to learn that. All right. Well, um, I'm excited to, to learn this stuff. Maybe this app will be available by the time I go. Uh, I'm planning on going to Japan next year also. Uh, so. Moving on. Thank you very much, Susan, again. Oh, one more question. Two questions. You just Google? One sec. I want to repeat also to make sure. So wait, repeat that question, please. Because that was... Yep. Uh, right. So the main way of doing desktop research, specifically in, it, in that initial exploratory. I use the government website for the most of the resources. It's called uh, White Paper. Is it? Is it? Is oh, you're. Too, or you yeah, White Paper's sure. White Paper. White yep. Paper. Okay. <laughs> white, I use White Paper for like a really. Um, good resources. Is, is white paper a service or is the what exactly what you use? Because white papers are something people present. Um, that was the, the what like the was it research that government did and then also published. So the government white papers. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you said you had what? Yeah. Oh, test. Test language. So how do you test this app? Uh, the main the test main method what were the main methods of testing so i made the wireframe first on figma and then uh present that to my uh user interview people and then uh ask for the feedback i also what i also did was also on figma made the higher high prototype and then uh actually observe how people go through the app that makes sense yeah all right yeah thank you thank you uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, you, Saki, Jasper, Mari, uh, for joining today. I'm really excited about this panel discussion on basically UX research when the culture is different. Um, so whether you're looking at insights, you know, on consumer purchasing behaviors or hoping to gain understanding on software decisions, research is needed. That's why everybody's here. Everybody understands that. Uh, many companies will have a signal that Japan is a good target market, but not necessarily you know, know how to gather the data to make decisions on the next steps. Um, and so I'd like to kick it off with uh, each person uh, doing a quick self-introduction, you know, talking about who, where, who you are, where you are calling in from or joining us from, uh, why UX and kind of like your experience. So I'm just going to call you out and uh, as looks like everybody's ready. Uh, let's start with you, Tiffany Morimoto-san. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. I'm you, Tiffany Morimoto. I usually go by Tiffany in a professional setting, so just go by Tiffany today. Um, I'm currently a UX researcher and designer at CureApp. Uh, CureApp is a Japanese digital therapeutics company, but I'm currently based in Austin, Texas, and have been living here for a year now. And I guess you said why UX or my background in UX. Um, yeah. I've been doing UX research things for five years now. Um, I studied in Japan, um, started off with human centered design, kind of branched out to UX over the years. And yeah, here I am doing UX research in both the US and Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Saki? Hey everyone, I'm Saki. It's not so nice to see everyone. So I'm Tokyo-based UX researcher and I'm originally from Japan and I currently work as a UX researcher at a company called Urban Planet, which is like a subsidiary of Toyota 
Motor Corporation. I'm sure some of you, maybe many of you, have Toyota cars. I hope you like it. But like, I'm not working actually for cars. Like, uh, one of the main projects at Urban Planet is to build Urban City, which is like a test course for building the future public of life. And yeah, so we are actually like building the city from scratch somewhere in Japan. So, yeah, and as a researcher, we are getting like tons of requests from hardware to software, like from robots to autonomous vehicles, from more like ar architectural problems to more like a political issues. So I think it's like a really good, like unique opportunity as a UX research researcher. And yeah, I started my career in more academia and focusing on accessibility. And yeah, and I, before that, I worked at Google New York office as a contract UX researcher for Google Fonts. And yeah, I think there, if there are many designers and developers here, maybe you know Google Fonts. But yeah, I did some like evaluation of new features and mockups there. And five months ago, I came back to Tokyo after six years in the US. So like right now, I, I'm having fun to see changes happened in past six years. I think it gets more like Tokyo especially gets more global, which is good. So yeah, I'm having fun. And outside of my work, I am a huge dog lover. So I love spending my time with my puppy going to the dog club. So yeah, feel free to send me pictures if you have dogs. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll share we'll share your contact info, and you're going to get a lot of dog pictures moving forward. I think uh, I will be asking a question about what your favorite Google font is, but you can answer it later. I want to give you a chance to think about it because I did this, that's uh, kind of going, coming out of nowhere. Uh, next, Jasper Wu. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jasper. Um, I'm currently based in Japan, as you can see my background. Uh, I I'm. I work at Google. Uh, I was the researcher. Um, um, yeah, so at the same time, I also an author. So I wrote two books uh, about design thinking and design spring. And if you are interested, you can find it on Amazon Japan. And I came to Japan like five years ago, almost six years. So yeah, I'm looking forward for today's event. And outside of my work, uh, I'm a huge Warriors fan. Uh, I like basketball and I'm, I'm also I like recently I'm into craft beer, so I try to explore different type of craft beer in Japan. <laughs> so yeah, nice to meet you. All right, and and I will be asking later what is your favorite, but uh, uh, beer that is not a book or anything. But uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Uh, rounding it out, Mari Kimata from B Tracks, actually. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mari Kimata. Um, I'm a UX researcher and designer at Btrax. Um, I'm based in Tokyo. Um, I think a lot of people here know about Btrax, but Btrax is a company based in SF in Tokyo. So we do research for both US market and Japanese market. Um, I studied UX at school, which is how I first got into UX. And um, I started doing research for both US and Japan um, since I joined Btrax. Um, so everyone was like uh, introducing what they like. So I guess, um, I'm into photography. Um, recently, I do a lot of film ph photographies and just collecting um, like a, a lot of film cameras. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And, and Mario will be in San Francisco next week. So um, the BTRAX team here is excited to see her. Uh, thank you for sharing of your, your backgrounds, your hobbies. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get into UX is what I've learned from meeting a variety of people. Some people, they study it in university. Some people go to a UX boot camp. Some people, it's their master's. Uh, I, I, and so I, I'd like to know, how did you get into your UX roles in Japan specifically? Uh, we'll start with Mari this time. We'll go back. Sure. Um, I first learned about UX when I was in university. Um, until then, I didn't even know what UX was. Um, but as I was taking classes, and I was, like, it was interesting to know that like designing user experience is actually a really important part of design. Because um, before knowing UX, like I thought designing was like about creating something cool, 
Um, and um, I had a little bit of experience like working design related, but like those places were like designing actual like, visuals, like websites, posters. And um, of course, like those kind of designs are fun too, but I wanted to like be involved from like the upper process of designing things. Um, which means like, you know, doing UX and um, yeah, and that's like when I met Beatrix and yeah. All right. So, so it sounds like you kind of come a little bit more from like a visual design, graphic design background initially, and then kind <laughs> of shift to doing more UX. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Jasper, how about you? Um, Author, yes. <laughs> what brings me to the UX? So. Uh, yeah, so actually I, I, at the beginning I'm kind of engineering, so I was working a lot of mechanical engineer, robotics, and doing a lot of human robot in action. Um, I think it's like a long time ago, and at the moment we believe in the future everyone will using robot. But like nowadays, no one still have robot in their home. We only have the room, like iRobot for clean up your floor. So this is the kind of the transition point. I'm thinking I want to build something or find out more something more close to the people. Uh, so that's why I was like jumping to more like service uh, related to product, apps or website for the internet. So yeah, it's kind of like transition when I realized actually no one interesting about robotics. So and it's not really put in human's life. So I really like to understand what people think. So that's why I started to focus on like, more UI, UX research. Got it. So potential UX is kind of a potential fallback until you get to start designing robots in the houses again. Yeah. That's kind of what I heard. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, Saki-san, you uh, from Japan, but kind of you have a different story around your UX. Um, yeah, so I started my career as a UX researcher in the US and I transitioned to, to Japan. So because like when I graduated from my undergrad in Japan, I even didn't know the term UX research or about anything. I didn't know anything about UX, UX but I was like lucky to get like a chance to meet HCI researchers in the US. And actually like my mom was, is totally blind and I haven't seen her struggle with so many things and but at the same time technology does improve her quality of life and so I kind of like like I believe like the power of technology I would say so and when I met HCI researchers maybe this is like something I can do using my experience and with my mom and that can be also my strengths as a researcher so that's kind of how I started my career in the US then the reason why I came back to Japan is like, I feel like <laughs> Japanese company often like don't consider user needs or user ability issue, like real usability. And, but also they have like high skills. They have like ability to produce high quality product. So, and also like UX research is not that common in Japan still, but UX is like such a fun job, but like there are less people who can evangelize in Japan. So that's kind of why I started thinking about going back to Japan, using bring back my experience and the knowledge to Japan. And luckily I got the offer from the client company at, around that time. So that's kind of how I came back to Japan. And very cool. All right. Well it's good to have you back in Japan and <laughs> uh sharing what you've learned and kind of you know evangelizing for uh the UX uh role. Uh, Tiffany, I know HCI is in your background. I think that's what you studied. Uh, so tell me more about your background. Yeah, definitely. So I grew up in the US and after high school, I went to undergrad in Japan and I did like computer science in high school. So I kind of knew web designs. So I knew that I wanted to get into that field. So in undergrad, I'll, they had my school offer like human centered design classes. So I started taking those and I was in a lab for two years that studied pattern language and pattern language. I don't know if you guys know, but it's a, I guess a coin term by Christopher Alexander. And then it's not really relevant to, I mean, it's not directly relevant to UX research, but if you kind of dig deep, it is part of UX research. So I, my, I guess, base is started from pattern language and that kind of build up to 
having internships and like opportunities conducting UX research in Japan. So that kind of kicked off my career. So I stopped like attending classes and just wasn't more in the field by then. So yeah. And then actually I met Jasper at a company I was working in Japan and Jasper was telling me all about his UX experiences. And he kind of pushed me to go back to the US and take my master's course in HCI. So yeah, Jasper is one of the reasons why that I wanted to learn further in English. So, yep, <laughs> that's I am. And then, yeah, still doing it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, this was a good start to understanding kind of where you all came from, all very different backgrounds and interests. Uh, and I, you know, one of the things that I do see as a thread between you all is your UX kind of experience in Japan uh, for the most part, it seems like has been around uh, working with global companies who may already kind of uh, understand UX research, right? Like, I mean, Woven Planet uh, and and, and uh, Google, um, Mercari, and and Hulu and these other uh, organizations. So, I would love to know more about like the differences in how UX is discussed or appreciated uh, when talking to a. Japanese company versus a non-Japanese company. Um, how do you how do you structure those conversations, or you know how do you get buy-in potentially? Like obviously you're ready, you're hired for a certain role, so there's some level of buy-in. Uh, but uh, does anybody want to take this one first? I guess I, will... I can go Thank then. <laughs> go ahead, I think might be really high level but like when you first chat about ux with a japanese company it comes with a lot of education first like what is user experience what you know covers what's under you user experience right because i worked at b tracks in the past before so hi i'm an ex b tracker <laughs> and when we i guess we're talking to clients and such a lot of the clients will come up to us being like hey you know we need revenue or we want sales but then as a you know ux research company or like a say, design company we're like okay what can we optimize or like do something something and then like i think a lot of like I guess discussions happen where like we're optimizing UX, but then they're not seeing immediate quick results. And I think that's like the expectations that we need to set when we're talking to Japanese companies. We kind of have like different levels of understanding of what UX can do and such, I guess. I think that's like one of them. I see a lot of yeah. heads nodding um, in agreement. Um, Mari, what, what about, how about you? How about your experience in working? I'm, I'm guessing it's similar to Tiffany's since you both have B-Tracks background, but I'd love to know how, how the conversations go. Um, yeah, it's really um, similar to Tiffany's, but um, I noticed like that many companies in Japan, like um, they're not really familiar with UX. So it's like, um, how does it work? What's the process like? Um, and like most of the companies in Japan, like they don't have a role as a UX designer or a researcher. Like as long as it's not a design agency or like some industry related to design. Um, but like when you say like UX in the States, I feel like more people understand what it is and like there are more roles as a UX researcher, like even if it's not a design related company. Okay. Uh, Jasper, how about yourself? You've, you've worked with a variety of large companies, especially. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, th I think it's very similar. Like. Tiffany share. I think it's a lot come out with a lot of education. And I always thinking about it's about the maturity of the company or the team. So as some 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 company, uh, if they are big company and they have different type of team, sometimes they have different product, right? So different product they're facing is like to be company to, to to business side or to client side and they will be different like so i think for the team also have the different level of the maturity so i think this is not only about japan company or not japanese company and sometimes even in non-japanese company but in some team because they never uh facing to like customer phases the product so they don't have the experience 
before. So it's com it's kind of hard for them to understand what's a UX and how UX can benefit them. Uh, from my point of view, is always thinking about um, for for the team when you try to do something, how much confidence you are. Like if you are confident about what you're trying to build, yeah, for sure. Like just follow your gut and go for it. But if you have a lot of decision making you need to make, and you have like so many unknown, especially for the market for the user. Yeah, then try to do the research, understand your cu customer and understand your user. Try to reduce your uncertainty. So I think this is much very, very important thing to think about, like how can we bring the uh, value of the UX to the leadership or the decision maker? Like if the, like we, we also a lot of time I work in a startup before, uh, as Tiffany mentioned. Um, so a lot of time uh, a startup like leader, they ba basically why why they success because they have a really good instinct and they know how to success. So a lot of time maybe they don't need too much like UX and just follow their guts. But when the company getting bigger and bigger, there's a lot of decision making need to make and there's more uncertainty coming out. So I think this is a time and the phases when we need more research to come in. So it depends. So yeah, and there's no perfect <laughs> answer for that. Yeah, oh. yeah. A lot of it probably depends on who you're talking to, what level what, what their level of understanding is. Uh, Saki san, I have another question for you, Saki. Um, You've done UX research in both the US and Japan, right? And so uh, what kind of methods have you seen as popular or more relevant for the Japanese market or when researching Japan? Um, even, and you can even just go into, well, this is what I did in the US, but in Japan, I tend to do this more often. Well, so I, I think like marketing research is like a much more common in Japan and there are like many vendors and the agency focusing on marketing or like recruiting. So I kind of tended to use like the, tended to work with like the, those like vendors and the agency in Japan. But like when I was in the US, I really don't have to use it. I can recruit people by ourselves through the, you know, the local network or companies like companies infrastructure. But like here in Japan, like it's kind of harder to find a participant. So we kind of rely on those vendors. But in terms of like research method, I don't see like a much difference between US and in US and Japan, because I think I come from like more qualitative like background. Like so I use like interviews, usability testing, user interviews. But like these three, I still use these three methods in Japan, just like recruiting and like how to approach like participant is a bit different. But in terms of method, I don't see like much dif like difference. Yeah, I, that's, that's good insights right there. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on this? Like, uh, Tiffany? I, yeah, I think like the biggest difference between in, in Japan, it will be more in person. The tech literacy in Japanese people is pretty surprising. Like even it's like 2022 when you're on a regular Zoom call, you can't ask them to share their screen. Like it's impossible in any age or demographics, like unless they work at a tech company and they're like, they use Zoom at their company. If they don't use Zoom, it's like, you can't ask to share their screen and such. So I think in Japan, interviews are common, but it, it's much, much easier if it's in person. Because if you want to do a prototype testing and such, and like you ask them to open up a Figma prototype and like ask them to share their screen, like how we do that in the US, that's like much harder. And I've been doing that last week. So I know that it's <laughs> nearly impossible right now. So I'm struggling with that. So yeah, I think that's the one highlight I wanted to make. Got it. And if you're, if you're doing a Zoom uh, interview in Japan, uh, is are they usually joining via a mobile then? or? Yeah, that's a really good question. They will join on any device. Even if you write, please join on a computer, they will not join on a computer. And that that goes for like Google Meet Zoom. Like I said Zoom because we're using Zoom, but like any, what you would call it, video calling tool, like they will join and whatever device they feel comfortable with and could be mobile most of the times. Hmm. Uh, any, any other insights, Mari or Jasper? Um, may, maybe it's not, uh, if comparing with Japan, I think a lot of uh, Japan 
I think majority of the population they are pretty familiar with the internet. So I think uh, in Google sometimes or we have the like like region or countries like low literacy for the internet. So I think this is a little bit different. Like if we really want to reach those target, so sometimes maybe uh, with low internet. Uh, usage or people not familiar with the internet, then uh, they might need to more like ethnographic research, like field research to really understand people. But I think in Japan, since everyone is a really like compared with other country, I think Japan uh, have a higher um, understanding of the internet. So it's just about um, yeah, it's not not much uh, different. I think so. It's just like how you reach those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and when doing user uh, interviews in Japan, it's historically one to one as opposed to focus groups, or like that's something that historically I've noticed. But I wanted to see if that's if you all agree. If you're like, no, you know, focus groups happen too. But um, what do you think? I, I think it depends on the problem we try to solve, like okay. how. Like how, what kind of problem you try to solve, what kind of insight you try to get. So I always thinking about the research planning is important to understand your goal, your objective, what you're trying to do, and then decided your method. So yeah, yeah, method for me always come to the last one to always consider and also consider the time and budget. Sometimes you don't have time, don't have budget, which, what you can do. So it's a lot of things during the research planning. So from my perspective. Hello, this is Pratim. Can I add something here? Sorry, where, where is it? I'm looking, where are you, sir? I'm Pratim from Japan. Okay, go ahead, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll open so it up. This is uh, regarding the internet.
my insight that、uh, surprised me is like going back to like the low digital tech literacy that I think that Japan has. Is I, ha- I was on a project、um, interviewing and studying high school and college students in Japan, and we were trying to explore the education tech. And the space and what kind of like products we can provide for these students, and for college students, we found out that they write their essays on their mobile devices because they don't own a laptop or computers. And then I'm just like, you write a 1,500 words essay on a mobile <laughs> device? How do you do that? And they're like, well, there's no other way. I'm like, oh, okay, because like, I guess the school. Like those school that I interview was like you know a public school like in the outskirts of Tokyo, like suburbs of Japan and such. So they recently transitioned from like paper essays to digital essays. So, but the students were not ready and such. So they just even text it to their friends because they don't have any like apps that they can write essays on. So they write their essays online on like the Line app. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, we're in. That was this was last year. So I'm like, we're in 2021 right now, right? Like, am I talking to people in modern age? But that was just me. But that was really surprising for me. Yeah. Wow, that is surprising. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, this is quite usual, you know, because Japan the rate of digital transformation is very slow. You know,、yeah. people has that you know idea that Japan is very up to date, cutting edge. Which is true at certain age. It is a combination of traditional technology and up-to-date technology. But when it comes to digital transformation, so the digitalization and digital transformation, these two hasn't meet properly in Japan. You know, so even if you have lots of digital data and digital contents, how that digital content will merge with the real, real life? That is where the you know where you. Come about, you know, industry four and all these things you talk about. That's why those things is not propagating in Japan because of the infrastructure which can interact with the real life. The digital life and the real life doesn't integrate in every cases. You know? So、there's, that is one issue. Of examples of you know、uh, areas of Japan that may be、uh, a little bit more、um, pre-digital. Um, yeah. But you know, and digital transformation is happening. But there's also like the examples I would have never thought of having to write an essay on the mobile.、Uh, good、mm-hmm. example, Tiffany,、um, Saki, or Jasper, or M- Mari. Maybe for me, once one thing I surprise in Japan is like people in Japan don't care about usually don't pay much attention to data sharing. They can sh- they share their all of their data. So. Like without like checking like all like agreement like so it's so for us for researchers it's good because it's easier to get collect the data but like I'm kind of a bit worried about Japanese people like yeah compared to like UK like EU UK EU like US people like they share everything just trusting is that or is it kind of not- yeah kind of trusting they don't care like. Japan is like you know isolated small island, so、mm-hmm. probably they over trust what's happening in Japan. So,、yeah. well, I, I would I'd be interested in also like you know if you're doing the interview or you're interacting and you're Japanese versus maybe somebody who's not Japanese that may not be the case as much. I don't know because、um, that's one thing that we do talk about right when you're entering the Japanese market. There's that trust building, that credibility piece that needs to be enforced and kind of like. Worked on、uh, when when kind of looking at Japan. Jasper, Mari,、um, we we're, we're good. I think one thing that we'll be doing now is is because you know there's so much we can continue to talk about, but I'd love to have it be kind of more of the the intimate networking piece of it too. So you know we have some breakout rooms that are going to be、uh, set up in a sec. But before we do, there's going to be a lightning round session right now,、um, and so. I would like to know, and and Tiffany, you can say Jasper's book if you want. But、uh, what is your inspiration, or where do you go for inspiration around, you know, the UX research space, or just、um, understand research and things like that? The internet, there's a lot of great things. So I sign up on a lot of newsletters, and I try to read two to three articles every day about UX research. 
Favorite newsletter then? Let's let's get more specific. Uh, UX Collective and UX Database. All right,、um, Jasper. Yeah, I agree with Tiffany. I I read the same from the same media sources,、uh, and actually I spend a lot of time just walking around outside Tokyo. <laughs> I just walk around observing people, and you know, on the street.、Um, recently, I think maybe this. Past two or three years, I think Oshikatsu is kind of important, like in among young people. And I was like, oh, oh my god, what is these things? And you can see so many like younger generation taking photo on in the Shibuya station and just waiting for a long line to take in the photo with the idol they like. So I was like really surprising, like how those kind of thing happen around me. So I I, I do、uh, re- read the article on the internet, but I also spend some time outside、uh, my my room. I love that you find inspiration in real life. Good job. Yes,、uh, awesome,、uh, Saki. Yeah, besides reading articles like Tiffany Jasper, so I I think I. Have some like like maybe monthly meeting with some of my mentors in the U.S. So I have like a really good relationship with like my ex manager or like ex colleagues, or maybe like professors. So like catching up with like these like industry academic like leaders is like really good for me to like you know catch up things happening around the world. Okay, thank thank you. And rounding out, Mari, where do you find inspiration? Um, it's not like I like check a specific like website, but I just follow some like that UX related like, accounts on social media and just like、um, click to like random articles. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so、uh, thank you very much, all of you, for、uh, sharing your knowledge, insights. I hope people found、uh, what you shared kind of like interesting and educational. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, again, and I'll see everybody else back here in about 25 minutes.